Dr. Jason Saunders here, and today we're gonna to talk about the introduction to hyperbaric oxygen. HBOT 101. It's really important to us that we start to help people better understand exactly how hyperbaric works. Because while there are a lot of different oxygen delivery devices and therapies out there, all of which are great, hyperbaric is able to do something that nothing else can do. And I think it's probably one of the most misunderstood therapies out there. And we're starting back at the beginning, really breaking things down in a simple way, because I really want people to understand exactly how it works, why it works, and why it is able to do something that no other therapy is able to do. And so uh, HBOT 101 is really about, uh, you know, on a molecular level, uh, what is happening when we create this pressurized environment and why is that so important? Right now at sea level, there is a pressure and that pressure is allowing you to absorb oxygen and saturate your red blood cells. And the thing to know right out of the gate is that when your red blood cells are fully saturated, it means that you really can't hold any more oxygen in your red blood cells than what you have right now. And it also typically means that there's a very low amount of oxygen in the plasma of your blood as we speak. And that's the mechanism by which hyperbaric is different. And that's how by by increasing the pressure of your environment, it's increasing the amount of oxygen you're absorbing. Your red blood cells will still be 100% saturated, but what we're really doing is we're bypassing the red blood cell carrying capacity and we're starting to utilize the plasma, which normally contains very little oxygen, to all of a sudden become a reservoir able to hold very, very high amounts of oxygen in the right environment. So let's talk about how that happens. The first thing to understand is that Oxygen absorption happens because of diffusion. Diffusion is the passive transport of molecules from high concentration to low concentration. The rate that those molecules will move from high concentration to low concentration is very specifically related to the differential in the gradient. In other words, if you had 50 things on this side and 49 on the other side, there's not a whole lot of influence to move the 51 over to the other side. However, if you had 100 units on this side and only one or two units on this side, that driving force, the differential in the gradients is much higher. And as a result, the influence of, of moving those molecules from high concentration to low concentration will be much stronger. And ultimately, things move down their concentration gradient all the way up until they reach a point of equalization or saturation. In other words, let's say we had 50 on one side and 50 on the other side they would cease to move. With hyperbaric oxygen, that typically never happens because the cells are always metabolizing oxygen. And as long as cells are alive and metabolizing the oxygen, there's always gonna be this need or this usage of oxygen and the drawing of oxygen from circulation into your cells. The other thing that we know is that when we're hiking, let's say to some altitude, or we actually get an airplane, go from sea level to Denver or, or even higher, let's say Mount Everest, what we know is, that the higher you get away from the Earth's surface, the harder it is to breathe. And the thing that we all say to each other is there's less oxygen at, at altitude. And while that is true, it's not a less percentage of oxygen. That's really something I want people to understand. Air is 21% oxygen at the surface. Air is 21% oxygen at the top of Mount Everest. It really doesn't matter where you are. Air is always 21% oxygen. But what happens is as you go up in elevation, you lose pressure. And so the molecules get further and further apart. And so every time you take a breath in, you're bringing in less molecules of oxygen, which means the pressure of oxygen is lower, which means the driving force of oxygen into your plasma is not as strong, which means your red blood cells will not become as saturated and they need to work harder in order to deliver the oxygen. So you'll see that respiratory rate goes up, heart rate goes up, because your body's gonna work harder and harder to try to bring oxygen to the working tissue. Now, let's say I lived at sea level for a while and then I moved to uh, Denver. There would be a period of time where my body feels like it has to work harder in order to um, deliver the oxygen that my body requires, but over time, I'll adapt to that. And the way we adapt to that is we literally build more red blood cells. In other words, if I can't fully saturate my red blood cells as much as I want to, I need more transport vehicles. I need more red blood cells to get as much oxygen as they can so that I can deliver uh, oxygen to all my other cells. And so that's the adaptation that we get once we live at altitude for a period of time. So what is hyperbaric? Hyperbaric is about increasing 
pressure. It's about going now below sea level. So if we want to go below sea level, all of a sudden the pressure of oxygen, it's the opposite of altitude, the pressure of the oxygen increases dramatically. And as we increase the pressure of the gases around us, when we breathe in, we breathe in more molecules, which creates a greater differential uh, pressure gradient between our lungs and our circulation, which is a larger driving force for that oxygen to be absorbed into the plasma of our blood. Just to give you an idea of how powerful it is to go below sea level, at one atmosphere, which is sea level pressures, at one atmosphere, if I wanted to climb high enough to find half of an atmosphere, to cut my pressure in half, I'd have to go about 23,000 feet above sea level in order to get half of an atmosphere. If I was at one atmosphere and I wanted to double my pressure, if I wanted to see how far do I have to go below sea level in order to double the amount of pressure, it's only 33 feet. And so because of how quickly pressure increases as we go below the surface, it makes exposing people to very high pressures, or I should say higher pressure gradients of oxygen, very, very easy inside of a hyperbaric chamber mm -hmm. because it's not a lot of depth required in order to create that process. So at sea level, there's just the right amount of pressure required for the red blood cells that we have to become fully saturated, 100% saturated, which allows those red blood cells to carry as much oxygen as possible and bring that all the way down to our cells and then ultimately deliver that oxygen to our cells. And as long as we're basically fully saturated, we can use you know, a pulse oximeter, I'm sure you've all seen them. So you put a pulse oximeter on your finger and if, as long as you're relatively healthy, there's no cardiovascular or respiratory issues, no problems with your lungs or your heart, you should be about 100% saturated, maybe 97 to 100% saturated if you were to look at it on a pulse oximeter. And that's how normal circulation works because of the pressure of our environment, the pressure of our atmosphere. But inside of a hyperbaric chamber, what we're doing is we're, we're changing atmospheric pressure. We're going inside of a device. We're creating an increase in the pressure around us. We don't feel that on our bodies. It's just the gas around us. Just like you don't feel your atmosphere right now, or you don't really feel pressure, let's say when you're flying in an airplane, you don't feel the pressurized cabin other than in your ears, but we don't feel the pressure on our body. But as a result of pressurizing the atmosphere or the environment around us, we can change the way our body is absorbing oxygen. And specifically, we can change the amount of oxygen we're absorbing. And this is governed primarily through two gas laws. There's, there are more, but, but for the most part, Boyle's law and Henry's law are the ones governing uh, the majority of how hyperbaric works. And so Boyle's law says, as I compress a gas, I can create that same amount of gas in a much smaller space. And then there's Henry's law, which says, if I compress that gas and I hold that gas compressed in a smaller space over a liquid, I can now dissolve that gas into the liquid that I'm holding it next to. Probably the easiest example to understand this is a bottle of seltzer. If I showed you two bottles of, you know, of water, let's say, one had gas in it, seltzer, and one didn't, but we hid the labels from you, just by looking at them, it might be hard to tell which one is which. Sure, you can squeeze it, right? Or you can shake it, but if you couldn't touch it and you were just looking at the two bottles, they would pretty much just look like two bottles of water. So in order to really know which one was which, you'd have to open the bottle. And what happens when you open water? Nothing. <laughs> but what happens when you open a bottle of seltzer? All of a sudden, those bubbles start coming to the surface and they start leaving the bottle. And if we poured those out, we would see that difference very clearly. So the same is true inside of a hyperbaric chamber. With the bottle of seltzer, what we did was we took, a, we took water and then we pressurized carbon dioxide. We held the carbon dioxide next to the water and that carbon dioxide now got dissolved into the water and then we put a cap on it. And now that's a pressurized uh, liquid, carbon dioxide used as the gas and the water as the liquid. In a hyperbaric chamber, what we're doing is we're pressurizing oxygen and then we're holding it over your body, which is primarily liquid but mostly for your plasma. And so all of a sudden, as we hold the higher pressure of oxygen over the, the liquid portion of your blood, which is plasma, we're able to dissolve much higher levels of oxygen into your plasma than what would normally be found under normal circumstances. And so long as you stay inside that chamber, the amount of pressure you're being exposed to, the percentage of oxygen that you're breathing at the time, and then the length of time you're in that chamber, you're just gonna keep absorbing more and more oxygen being dissolved into the plasma of your blood. And then just like the seltzer, 
as soon as you open the seltzer bottle and those bubbles start coming out, well, when you get out of the hyperbaric chamber, the same thing happens. There's no more pressure or extra pressure to keep that extra oxygen into circulation. And so that oxygen starts to literally bubble out of your circulation. You won't feel that. You don't, you have, you have no perception that that's happening. But as the oxygen is bubbling out of your circulation, it has amazing effects on your body and it's interacting with your cells and your cells are using that excess oxygen for doing all the tasks that those cells need to do, whatever they happen to be. Inside that chamber, as we're pressurizing that gas and you're breathing it in, and that creates a pressure gradient, which is driving more oxygen into your circulation. And then that increased pressure is then driving more oxygen into your cells while you're in the chamber. So about half of the therapy occurs while you're inside the, the chamber itself. And then when you get out of the chamber and that oxygen starts leaving your circulation, that's the other half of the therapy. As it's leaving your body, number one, it's interacting with your cells. And so it continues to nourish and feed your cells the oxygen they need to function. But number two, it also sets off a whole cascade of cell signaling, of ce cells talking to one another. And a lot of that cell signaling is responsible for a lot of the growth factors and the regeneration of tissue and the rebuilding of microcirculation and the stimulation of our immune system. So, you know, a lot of the benefits that, that we look for long-term from hyperbaric have to do with getting out of the chamber and having all of that excess oxygen leaving your body, feeding your cells, but also setting off, you know, a handful of different cell signaling cascades, which we will cover in some other videos down the road. And that is really what makes hyperbaric very different from other therapies that are out there. And then the plasma itself typically only carries about three milliliters per liter of oxygen. Under hyperbaric conditions, it could hold up to 60 milliliters per liter. And so there's an enormous increase in the amount of oxygen being uh, carried in your uh, circulation, depending again on those three factors, how much pressure are you being exposed to, what percentage of oxygen are you breathing, and then how long are you in that chamber. Ultimately, as a result of hyperbaric oxygen, there are three main effects that I would want you to know that happen or that help um, contribute to all the changes we see in patients going through hyperbaric oxygen. So number one is right away, every session, there's an increase in free floating oxygen. In other words, while you're in that chamber and that chamber is being pressurized, you're getting all this extra oxygen being dissolved in your plasma and that oxygen while you're in there is able to go through circulation, interact with your cells. And because of that pressure gradient, it's able to really get um, a lot more oxygen than, than what it would normally be able to get. The other, which is also very important, is that there are many cases of trauma, damage, um, crush injuries, or post-stroke. Anytime there's damage or inflammation around the capillaries but near your cells, if red blood cells can't get through those capillaries and they start to build up, then anything on the other side of that damage or trauma or inflammation starts to starve. It literally, if it can't get oxygen, it can't produce energy. And if the red blood cells aren't getting through and oxygen can't get through, there's really nothing that's going to save that tissue. Now that could be systemic hypoxia because of a respiratory issue or a cardiovascular issue. We're not getting enough oxygen into our body. But in most cases, we're getting plenty of oxygen in our body into circulation. But let's say I hurt my arm, I damaged my arm. I could check with a pulse oximeter. I could check the, you know, my left hand and I'll be 99% saturated, but I can still have tissue damage in an area that's becoming hypoxic because red blood cells can't get to that area. So that's where hyperbaric fits in. Once we dissolve all that extra oxygen into your plasma, we're no longer relying on red blood cells to carry the oxygen. Oxygen is dissolved in the plasma. So in a place where red blood cells couldn't get through, but the liquid portion, the plasma can, and now the plasma, which normally has very little oxygen, is flooded with oxygen, we could now refeed an area that's becoming hypoxic and start to make that area function normally again. Long term, once we do that for weeks on end, what we're really able to do, one of the main benefits of, of hyperbaric is angiogenesis. So in the short term, we're going to feed that tissue so that we can wake it up and get it functioning normally again. But long term, we're literally going to be able to rebuild capillary networks so that once the therapy is complete, you know, you, you'll no longer need hyperbaric in order to get oxygen to that hypoxic damaged tissue because the capillary network that delivers the oxygen will, will be healed. And then the third thing is really about how 
oxygen interacts with our cells when we get out of the chamber. If you remember what we talked about with Boyle's law and Henry's law was we're going to compress that gas and then we're going to hold that gas over a liquid, which is going to dissolve the gas into the liquid, which is for us, it's oxygen being dissolved in our plasma. And then when we get out of the chamber, that gas needs to start coming out. Well, there's a certain distance that oxygen can typically travel when it leaves a capillary to interact with a cell. But when you get out of a hyperbaric chamber, because of that loss of excess pressure, the gas comes out at a much higher rate. And all of a sudden now you're able to interact with cells up to four times of a greater distance. So again, when we're talking about damaged tissue or tissue that's becoming hypoxic and we're trying to flood it with as much oxygen as possible, all of a sudden a capillary that normally wouldn't be able to reach a certain tissue because it's too far away. Now, when you get out of the chamber and that gas can now travel four times further in order to interact with that cell, we can have massive impacts in terms of how much oxygen we're able to deliver to inflamed tissue, to damaged tissue, to really stimulate a healing response. Overall, there are basically two main categories of benefit as a result of hyperbaric. There's short-term benefits and long-term benefits. And the short-term benefits have a lot to do with mitochondrial function. You know, oxygen delivery to the mitochondria is one of the rate limiting steps to ATP production. And so when you go into the chamber and you're getting all of this extra oxygen and this extra oxygen is ultimately making its way into your cells and into your mitochondria, you're now able to upregulate ATP production, upregulate energy production. And what that does is it creates a scenario where the cells can function more optimally or generate a whole healing recovery and regenerative process in order to heal from whatever particular damage or, or inflammatory disease that somebody might be exposed to. The other from the long term is really about what they call intermittent hyperoxia. It's, it's going into the chamber, getting all this extra oxygen in your body, and then getting out of the chamber and having it leave your body, going back into the chamber, having it come in, getting out of the chamber, having it go out. As we go through these waves of what's considered to be hyperoxia back to normal oxygen levels, uh, it creates a wave of cell signaling. And a lot of the research right now coming out is looking more at that cell signaling and, and trying to understand that better, because that seems to be, if, if not as important, potentially even more important than the mitochondrial effect, because it's the cell signaling that seems to have an effect on cytokines and inflammation. It's the cell signaling that seems to have an effect on stem cells and regenerative therapies and growth factors that are all stimulated to really create a massive healing response inside of tissue. And so that cell signaling cascade from the wave of hyperoxia over weeks and months seems to be the, the, the most important in terms of long-term benefits from hyperbaric. But ultimately, both are true and both are important. There are these short-term benefits, of course, of every session. And then there are these long-term benefits of going through a series or a protocol of hyperbaric over the course of weeks and months. And together, that leads to the majority of the changes that we see in hyperbaric. And over the next few videos, we're gonna discuss a little bit more in depth, what are those mitochondrial changes that occur? And then separately, what are those cell signaling changes that occur as a result of hyperbaric? So we'll see you next time. Thanks again.